There's something to be said about the city of New Orleans, a city that so profoundly captures both the old world and the new in its never-ending nightlife, its renowned cuisine, and the celebration of a diverse African, French, and American culture. Indeed, it seems like the sort of place where if magic could take place, it would be here, in the Big Easy. Of course, this brings me to one of New Orleans' most notable residents, Marie Laveau, the woman said to be the voodoo queen. Despite having been dead for over 200 years now, people still say that Marie Laveau has power over the city. Going by what the legends say about her voodoo practices, Laveau would perform remarkable feats, some saying they are nothing short of miracles. In this video, we'll primarily be focusing on Louisiana voodoo, or New Orleans voodoo, which is a product of the religion Voudon, though heavily influenced by the Christian and French culture of New Orleans, in which Marie Laveau would become a staple of. Although there is plenty of information about Marie Laveau in the legends and lore of New Orleans, separating the facts from myth isn't exactly easy. We know little of Laveau's early life, other than that she was likely born in 1801, to a wealthy plantation owner, as some sources say, and his black mistress. Her father, who is also cited as being Charles Laveau, may also have been something of a politician, going on to become a mayor of New Orleans in 1812. Her mother was named Marguerite, and was also said to be something of a voodoo practitioner. We also know that Laveau would go on to marry a man named Jacques Paris, a carpenter who would give her two children. However, Paris would suddenly go missing in 1824, whereby Laveau would speak of his death, claiming to be a widow. Though it's equally believable that Paris had simply deserted Laveau, but that she was too prideful to admit this. After all, she was described as being a beautiful woman, tall with dark curly hair and golden skin. At the pinnacle of her notoriety, tabloids would describe her as having good features. Good features at the time meaning that she appeared to have the physical traits of a white woman more than a black one. After Paris's death, Marie would begin working in a beauty parlour as a hairdresser. This is actually one of the most important parts of her life, for it's here that she would service the wealthy white and Creole women of New Orleans, whereby they would confide in her their most intimate secrets, desires, information about their husbands, lovers, their estates, and family affairs. Many believe that this wealth of information that Laveau would receive on a daily basis is what gave her political leverage, and is the reason why she was able to rise up through the social ranks. Laveau would later begin a relationship with a man named Louis Christophe de Glapion, a man from a powerful local family whom she would birth 15 children to in rapid succession. It would lead her to quit hairdressing and devote her time to raising her brood. It's here she began to take interest in her mother's voodoo practices and traditional African beliefs. Voodoo had a sinister reputation for itself in Louisiana and was even banned at several points Many believed it was the art of the devil, and that it was here to usurp Christianity, turning Christians and good folk onto a darker path filled with mystics and magics. Of course, many who held this view were not entirely familiar with voodoo and traditional African beliefs, and were likely to embellish the practice to serve their own agenda, citing it as evil, corrupt, or otherwise blasphemous. But this didn't stop Laveau and many of her clientele from practicing voodoo. In fact, Laveau herself would learn most of her craft from a voodoo doctor in New Orleans, who was simply and rather insidiously known as Dr. John. What separates Louisiana voodoo from Voodon and other forms of voodoo is the Catholic influence that people like Laveau infused with it. Louisiana voodoo would incorporate holy water, incense, statues of saints, and even consisted of Christian prayers, thus making it more acceptable to the upper class and more appealing to those who were devout to Christianity. A lot of Laveau's beliefs included spiritual forces, as is common in all voodoo, whereby the spirits which are summoned can be either benign or mischievous. The idea was that these spirits connected with the followers of voodoo, guiding them, imparting some form of divine knowledge, or simply bringing good vibes. How this was achieved was through a mixture of dance, music, singing, and even the use of snakes. In fact, Laveau herself was even said to have worn a pet snake around her neck, which was named Zombie. Some of Marie's notable services as the Voodoo Queen include the selling of Grigri bags, 
an amulet originating from Africa that is said to bring fortune and protect the wearer from evil. The Grigri bags were said to contain a variety of ingredients that were blessed by voodoo queens or voodoo doctors to bring the wearer a certain effect or destiny. Charms, magical powders, ailments and desire granting ornaments including those that could destroy a customer's enemies were also sold by Laveau. She would also conduct spiritual readings, telling fortunes, giving advice to those who sought it, and casting spells including cures, charms, or even curses for the right price. However, some historians believe that Laveau's feared powers were actually just clever acts, and that all of her divine knowledge about people's lives was merely acquired by the recording of many secrets that were spilled to her by her clients. Bearing in mind, she would be serving many prominent households in New Orleans, some of them likely to divulge certain sensitive information given her warm and compassionate persona. It's suggested that Laveau would use this information to further her own status, or would use this information to build the idea that she was indeed all knowledgeable. Another account has it that Laveau would use the black servants of rich whites to obtain information, and that she would do this by either instilling fear into the servants, threatening to curse or hex them, or simply pay them off. There is one story of Laveau's powers that would captivate all of New Orleans. Supposedly, a wealthy man's son was accused of a rape allegation and was set to face a long jail sentence. The evidence against the wealthy man's son was damning and it looked to be an open and shut case. Desperate to ensure his son's freedom and out of all options to achieve it, the wealthy man went to Laveau for aid. In exchange for her success in this matter, he would offer her a house. Laveau agreed and hosted a voodoo ritual where she underwent a form of self-torture. She placed three ridiculously hot guinea peppers in her mouth and held them there for hours as she appeased to the spirits. In voodoo, the belief is that the spirits take pity on those under great suffering, and so Laveau would use her pain to draw the spirits out and grant her what she sought. We use a guinea pepper, hotter than Haiti. When the gods see this willingness to suffer, to sacrifice, they pay attention. On the day of the hearing, Laveau snuck into the courthouse and placed the guinea peppers that had been in her mouth under the seat of the judge. Some believe that the energy from the spiritually enhanced peppers caused the judge to set the wealthy man's son free. As was the agreement, the wealthy man would then grant Laveau the house he had promised her. However, some historians dispute this case, stating that if such an occurrence did in fact take place, then it's likely that Laveau would have known the judge through her social circles, or would at least have known something incriminating about the judge for which she would have used to blackmail him with. Of course, she would have still used her voodoo theatrics to convince New Orleans that she did indeed possess magical powers, but some believe that the basis of her powers was merely political manipulation and intimidation. When Laveau passed away in 1881, she was said to have died with a smile on her face. Reporters of the time referred to her not as a sinister practitioner of dark magic, but as the kindest woman who ever lived, a saintly figure who nursed the sick and spread compassion amongst the diseased and the condemned. Laveau is buried in St. Louis Cemetery, in the Laveau Glapion family crypt. The burials are in vaults above ground, where Laveau's tomb attracts many visitors, even to this day. Many slabs in the area, including Laveau's own tomb, are marked by visitors with an X symbol. The idea stems from a decades old rumour that Laveau would grant wishes from beyond the grave if an X was marked on her tomb. Supposedly, the ritual goes something along the lines of marking an X on the tomb, turning around three times, knocking on the tomb, and then yelling out your wish. Should the wish come true, then the wisher would need to come back, circle their X so others would know of Laveau's power and then leave the voodoo queen an offering. One of Laveau's daughters, also named Marie Laveau, was said to carry on her mother's mantle after her death. By some accounts, she was the splitting image of her mother, though what she had in looks, she lacked in her mother's spirit. Some have said that she did not possess the warmth and compassion of her mother, and was more inclined to inspire fear. One of her most notable talents was the ability to fulfill the desire of any man. She would hold lavish parties at Mason Blanche, a building for the congregation of blacks and whites in New Orleans, where women would dance naked for men, politicians, and high officials. 
Essentially, this building, amongst others, would become something of a brothel. But it was never raided by the police, who feared that if they intervened, Marie Laveau II would curse them. Some would say that Marie Laveau II drowned in a lake after a big storm. Ever since then, both Laveaux have sunk into obscurity. Marie Laveau continues to be a central figure of Louisiana voodoo, however, and of New Orleans culture. It's said that gamblers even shout her name when throwing dice, or before big stakes. Additionally, there have been multiple tales of sightings of the voodoo queen, even to this day. And that wraps up the tale of Marie Laveau. But was she a powerful voodoo queen, capable of cures and curses, and contacting spirits? Or was she more of a political player, using a network of spies and her own cunning to enhance and embellish her abilities? You tell me in the comments below, and don't forget to like this video and hit the subscribe button. Our next occult legend comes from Jewish history, whereby a rabbi created a creature to protect other Jews, only to have it turn bloodthirsty and violent. Until the next time guys.